Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome SIGGRAPH 2017 Conference Chair, Jerome Solomon. Hello. Uh, my name is Jerome Solomon. I'm the SIGGRAPH 2017 Conference Chair, and I'm also the Dean of Cogswell College. I wanted to welcome all of you to SIGGRAPH 2017. At the heart of computer graphics and interactive techniques is the tagline for SIGGRAPH 2017. But this is actually more than just a tagline. Our contributors are at the heart of SIGGRAPH. These are the researchers, practitioners, the artists, and the engineers that have worked tirelessly over the past year, two years, three years, four years, five years, six years, seven years, to really get their work at a level of quality and innovation to where it can get into SIGGRAPH. We get thousands of submissions each year. And we have program chairs that are subject matter experts in their fields and incredible juries of subject matter experts to review this content. So you can be rest assured that the work that got into SIGGRAPH is the world's best. I'd like to thank and congratulate all of those contributors who got into this year's conference. And SIGGRAPH really is more than a conference. When I became the conference chair, when I was appointed conference chair about two years ago, I had dozens of people come up to me and they wanted to figure out how they could contribute to SIGGRAPH, how they could help out, what they could do to help me. And I interviewed probably 70, 80 different people. And what I learned through that process is that people really do love SIGGRAPH. We are friends, we are colleagues, and we are family. Every year, we come together to see old friends, to meet new friends, to learn new things, and to invite new people into our fold. This is a very loving community, and I'm very proud to be part of it. SIGGRAPH is a nonprofit volunteer organization. I'm a volunteer. Our executive committees are all volunteer people. Um, the program chairs are volunteers. The subcommittee members are volunteers. The student volunteers in the aisles around you in the pink shirts, they're all volunteers. And people really do spend a tremendous amount of time after work, away from family on weekends, at 1 a.m. and 2 a.m. in order to, to work on this conference and help pull it together. So I just wanted to have anybody that has volunteered for SIGGRAPH in any role ever to please just raise your hand. I'd like to see all the volunteers who are among us. I'd like to thank in particular the SIGGRAPH 2017 Conference Committee. These are some of the most talented individuals from very distinguished companies and universities that have spent many hours and nights to pull together this conference. So I want to thank those wonderful people. I'd also like to thank the three companies that we contract out to help pull together our conference, Smith Buckland, Freeman, and Hall Erickson that runs our amazing exhibit show floor. There are three women that I'd like to point out in particular that work for Smith Buckland that I like to call the three-headed dragon. It's, it's really amazing because you'll, you'll tell one of them one thing and then you'll see another one like literally 20 seconds later in another area and they know what you said to the other one. 
I don't know how they do it. They're just, just amazing. Um, that, and these people are Cindy Stark, Marsha Dalton, and Leona Cathy. I'd also like to thank Cogswell College, the staff, the talented faculty there, and our students, um, our acting president, Ken Banks, our president emeritus, Dr. Deb Snyder, for just all of their support in allowing me to spend time during my day job to work on SIGGRAPH. You know, I really couldn't have done this without the support of Cogswell College, and I appreciate the college very much. I'd also like to thank my family that are here, uh, my wife, Dr. Brett Solomon, my daughter, Bailey Alexis Solomon, and my son, Gabriel Quinn Solomon, and all of my mom and my other extended family. Thank you so much for coming out today. Most importantly, I wanted all of you to really have a great week. We planned a really, what I think is a excellent conference with a lot of new venues and features. So I'm really hoping you enjoy the conference. And on a more personal note, I wanted to thank each of you for the pleasure of a lifetime, really, to be your conference chair. Thank you so much. And with that, I'd like to introduce somebody that I consider a friend and a colleague Mr. Jeff Jertner, president of ACM SIGGRAPH. Jeff? Welcome to SIGGRAPH 2017. First thing I'd like to say is really just commend Jerome and his team on what a wonderful conference they have put together for your benefit. I think you're all going to enjoy it and, and have a really great time this week. So, you know, the definition here of, you know, what SIGGRAPH is, it's, you know, basically what we are, a premier organization for computer graphics and interactive techniques, and our organization is unique and diverse community. Well, what does that mean? Well, what it, I think uh, a good defining point for that is I can come to SIGGRAPH and let's say I'm a fine artist, and I may see friends from NASA and friends from university research departments, from people from automotive design studios, oil exploration companies, game studios, and even sometimes maybe even film studios. So for 44 years, SIGGRAPH has had a major impact in the world in computer graphics. And here are just uh, some simple examples of where we have a paper that resulted in films that win Academy Awards. Uh, they're successful at the box office. We have a perennial course advances in real-time rendering that started as a game course but it's had an impact in VR and film across the world. And lastly, we have research that leads to startup companies that started out at SIGGRAPH. Through um, emerging technologies, we've had a lot of bleeding edge concepts at the time that have come out, debuted, and now they've gone on. They're commonplace in the world today. And so I think for most of you, when you hear SIGGRAPH and think about it, for most people, their experience is this event, maybe SIGGRAPH Asia. But it's, it's more than that. And you may have noticed, for example, that our conference, you know, if you've been attending SIGGRAPH for a lot of years, may be a little smaller than it was previously. Changing economics, commoditization of graphics have changed some of that. But I'm pleased to state that really today and for the last few years, we've stabilized exhibitor revenue, registration, and in fact, we're growing again. As ex evidenced by this year, there's a 30% increase in our exhibit space. And this change really is because of the dedicated efforts of our past and conference, conference advisory group, the conference chairs, and our conference committees. But I would like to remind you that SIGGRAPH is much more than just the conference. So we're an organization that has a lot of other activities. We sponsor a lot of specialized conferences around the world, uh, support students, the digital library where you can find the publications for the many of the years for all of the SIGGRAPH. So we're much more of that. But 
the success is a bit double-edged in the sense that there's more and increasing conferences, small conferences, that are vying for your attention and participation. So how do we remain relevant? So there's more competition, and we've been discussing the future of SIGGRAPH for a number of years as I've been president. And so we reached the point where I asked Evan Hirsch, who is a member of our executive committee, and Bob Berger, our organizational development advisor, who both have a lot of experience in strategic development, to sit and let's sit down and figure out how to apply that to SIGGRAPH. And as a result of that, they've assembled a team of people for a meeting to start crafting a five-year vision for SIGGRAPH that I'd like to present to you now. So after a few days of this meeting, the group coalesced kind of around what's our core problem, what are we trying to resolve, where are we going, bouncing back and forth. And so we came up that basically the first piece is we want to enable everyone. And what does that mean, everyone? Well, it's our existing communities, but it's also those communities that haven't been integrated into us. And really, if you look at it, where is computer graphics today? It's everywhere. It's in the phone in your pocket, it's in medicine, it's in dentistry, it's in automotive. Our environment is really everyone. Second piece of that is, so what are we doing with that and for those people? And it's to tell their stories. So storytelling has been around for a huge amount of time, right? It's happened first humans getting together telling stories. But when we look at the next five or ten years, what we know there's going to be still enormous changes that are happening. And we want to support a community that keeps researching and developing and looking at tools of how do we present our ideas and tell our stories in whatever format it might be. It could be 2D, 3D, VR, art, uh, whatever those are. And it could even be in mediums that we have yet to develop. So how are we going to do this? So we've developed... Um, a strategy that's it's in its beginning stages and we are going to welcome input from all of you but basically it's improving our, our digital presence we have a website there's a lot of websites but we want to make siggraph.org or our presence synonymous with computer graphics so that when you think about it you're looking for information that's the place that you'd like to go and find the information or direct you to where you can find the appropriate information secondly we want to improve the graphics community uh, outreach communicating with more people, making sure our communication's working, getting input from you, giving back to you, and additionally, going out to those other communities that we aren't uh, really in place with. So we've had a lot of communities that have gone out from SIGGRAPH, that started at SIGGRAPH. We want to be uh, cooperating with them, getting content from them, giving them content, and also the new areas that are just using computer graphics. And lastly, we need to have a structure to support this. So we're doing a lot of things looking at the organization, our infrastructure, how we're structured, how conferences are structured, and we'll be looking at this and how everything uh, participates together. So as you are here this week, what I'm showing here is the picture. This is the team that did the strategic meeting and went together. Uh, seek out some of these folks, some of their EC uh, folks from different communities that were here. But we'd like to share with you our initiatives, get feedback from you on ideas, things that you'd like to see, changes, new ideas. We're open to that. We want to incorporate them. And really for the next five years to try and see how we can grow further. With that is how can you help? And really, we'd like you to vote. So we changed our voting schedule. It now ends after the SIGGRAPH conference. If you are a member, you should have an email. Please go out and do it. If you forgot code, there's ways to do that. If you go to the village, there's a booth at our booth there in the village that'll help you vote. The other place is to volunteer. As Jerome asked, there's lots of volunteers in the crowd, but that's what keeps us moving and going, and we can always use more. We have a new alias for volunteering. If you send that to that, you will get a response. And even if you don't know exactly what you want to do, we will direct you to someone who can work with you in any area that you might be interested in. And lastly, there is a Meet the Candidates forum. Uh, is designated here on Thursday, please come by. Also, our executive committee and the strategy group will be there to answer any questions you might have. And with that, I'd like to uh, welcome Bobby Schnabel, the ACM CEO, to give a few words. Thanks, Jeff, and good morning. 
It's a pleasure to welcome you to SIGGRAPH on behalf of ACM. I've been asked to take just a few minutes to let you know about ACM, the sponsoring organization for this conference. ACM is the oldest and largest society for computing researchers and practitioners. Conferences such as this are led by volunteers, so the people you see here on stage today and who have organized this week's program do this as volunteers to serve the community while holding down day jobs at universities, in industry, and at other organizations. As Jerome said before, we owe them great thanks. <laughs> ACM, through its conferences, journals, and other programs, serves a global community of over two million people. These are professionals not only from computing, but as the SIGGRAPH community knows well, and Jeff just mentioned, also a large number in allied fields, including designers, artists, filmmakers, and engineers. One high visibility activity of ACM is its conferences, and ACM sponsors nearly 200 conferences around the world each year. The SIGGRAPH community is a great example of ACM's international reach through its SIGGRAPH Asia conference, that will be held this year in late November in Bangkok, Thailand. To quote from Andrew Chen, the new editor-in-chief of our flagship publication, Communications of the ACM, in many fields, fundamental breakthroughs take years to reach the market and even longer to achieve full impact. Computing's clock speed is far faster. Known for its technical leadership, ACM strives to be on top of these advances. In keeping with this, SIGGRAPH, through its conferences and publications, provides a showplace for the most remarkable work in computer graphics and interactive techniques. In doing this, fields that once seemed technically distinct now share common interests and work together to achieve new goals. This interdisciplinarity incorporating techniques from areas such as AI and mixed reality, continues to push the boundaries for technical leadership in graphics. As a last point, I would like to mention a new ACM initiative, the Future of Computing Academy. Launched last month, the members of this academy represent the next generations of computing researchers and practitioners. They approach ACM and computing from the lens of a different experience than those of us who have been in the field for many years. We look to them to help shape ACM and lead computing for new generations of professionals. I'll stop here, but if you see me walking around, please feel free to stop me to chat or to ask questions about ACM. Thank you, and enjoy the conference. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Michael Cohn, the SIGGRAPH Technical Awards Chair. Good morning, and let me add my welcome to SIGGRAPH 2017. As you know, SIGGRAPH hands out a number of awards each year. Anonymous volunteer committees spend countless hours to come up with the winners that you see joining me on the stage right now. The Service, Artist, Dissertation, and Technical Awards committees do an enormous amount of work to make these selections. We chairs have the fun job. We get, to honor, we get the honor to present the awards, but I'd like to publicly thank the committees now for all the work that they do. And with that, we'll get started. I'd like to introduce Terrace Masson, who will present the Outstanding Service Award. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. You've heard a lot about volunteers so far tonight. Uh, I'm really lucky, uh, because working alongside our incredible contractors, the heart and soul of SIGGRAPH is our volunteers. From our SVs to our conference chair, 
it takes almost 600 volunteers working over 70,000 hours just to put on one five-day conference. Uh, that's over eight years of men and women hours uh, to give you what you're going to experience this week. It's a huge effort. And uh, to echo what everyone has said, I encourage you all to volunteer at all levels of the conference and the organization, starting with your local professional and student chapters. So check those out for sure. So the, the Outstanding Service Award is presented annually to recognize a career of outstanding service to ACM SIGGRAPH by a volunteer. It recognizes an individual who's given extraordinary service to both the SIGGRAPH organization and its conferences over a significant period of time. The award includes a lifetime membership to ACM SIGGRAPH. You knew that, right? Yeah, see, he's surprised. Uh, this year's award recipient is Rock, Dr. Alan Rockwood. <laughs> Since his first SIGGRAPH paper in 1981, Alan's taken an active role in shaping both of our major conferences, including his conference chair in 2003, as ACM SIGGRAPH Vice President from 2006 to 2009. You'll correct me if I get all this wrong, right? And heading the steering committee charged with initially planning the SIGGRAPH Asia Conference in 2006. Alan's also been instrumental in the long-term success of the technical programs for both SIGGRAPH and SIGGRAPH Asia, including serving as SIGGRAPH Papers Chair in 1999 and SIGGRAPH Asia Papers Chair in 2013. How am I doing so far? Okay. Alan additionally was active at the highest levels of ACM SIGGRAPH leadership, serving terms on the ACM SIGGRAPH Executive Committee, the Conference Advisory Group, and as chair of the SIGGRAPH Asia Conference Advisory Group. It takes a special kind of truly dedicated, some would say slightly crazy, dedicated individual to give so much time and energy to ACM SIGGRAPH organization in so many varied and important ways. It's my privilege to present you on behalf of the committee Ladies and gentlemen, the 2017 Outstanding Service Award recipient, Dr. Alan Rockwood. Uh, SIGGRAPH has, for 36 years, been my professional home. It's been an anchor to my profession. Uh, it's a large part of my life and my heart. So to the scholars and the artists, the business folks, friends, colleagues, collaborators, inspirers, uh, this community still amazes me after 36 years as much as it did the first time. Thank you. I love you all. Good morning. The Distinguished Artist Award for the Lifetime Achievement in Digital Art is awarded annually to an artist who has created a body of work that has significantly advanced the aesthetic content of digital art. This year's ACM SIGGRAPH's Lifetime Achievement Award in Digital Art is awarded to Ernest Edmonds as a pioneer in the field of computational art and has contributed to the broader field of contemporary art from the late 1960s. He has exhibited his work in many countries, most recently in the UK, China, Brazil, Australia, the USA, and Latvia. He is a professor of computational art at De Montfort University, Leicester, UK editor-in-chief of Springer's Cultural Computing Book Series and chair of the board of ISEA International. ACM is honored to recognize Ernest Edmonds for his pioneering achievements in the advancement of software as a creative medium. Thank you.
Thank you, Sue. I think I'm the tenth person to receive this wonderful honour for digital art. And it's a great, small, but very honourable club to join. I have a few thank yous I really must make. First of all, thank you, Sue, to your committee, whoever they are. And thank you to SIGGRAPH in general for this great uh, experience that I have now of receiving this award. Thank you to the artistic community, the many artists with whom I have worked, communicated, argued with over the years and learned from. And particularly, thank you to those artists with whom I have collaborated in making work. And thank you to my students, who have often taught me as much as I've taught them. And finally, thank you to my family and my friends who have always supported me and made it possible for me to do this work. Most notably of all, of course, my wife, Linda Candy, who has been my best supporter, who has suffered me in doing this work and also has been my greatest and most uh, difficult critic. Thank you. On the behalf of the ACM SIGGRAB Outstanding Doctoral Dissertation Award Committee, I am pleased to announce this year's two honorable mention, App Davis and Matthew O'Toole. App received MIT George Sprouse Award for Outstanding PhD Thesis in Computer Science. He was also among the 2016 Forbes 30 Under 30, 2015 Business Insiders, the eight most innovative scientists in technology and engineering, as well as 2015 tech technology that are building the future. Matthew has already received multiple best demo and best paper awards, including Mar Prize honorable mention. Let's congratulate App and Matt for their excellent dissertation research award. Now, let me introduce this year's ACM SIGGRAB Outstanding Doctoral Dissertation Award winner, Felix Haider. Felix received his PhD under the supervision of Wolfgang Heydrich from the University of British Columbia with a four-year doctoral fellowship support from its computer science department and a video graduate fellowship. He is currently postdocing at Stanford University and will be joining Princeton University as a system professor in the fall. His research interests lie in computational imaging and display that promises to revolutionize both the display technology and photography through the introductions of computations, thereby making both display and imaging technology more robust, less expensive, and more portable. Even more importantly, his thesis allows possibly completely new imaging modality that were previously impossible to imagine. He has developed a flexible image signal processor uh, called Flex ISP framework for solving a wide range of low-level imaging uh, reconstruction problems, including the mosaicing, HDR reconstructions, and more. The astonishing results of his work can be applied to very exotic camera design, as well, at the same time, be able to outperform the best dedicated algorithm on standard design. Much of his work is currently being commercialized by a Montreal-based uh, startup, Algorlux. His work on time of flight image sensor has found novel application like looking around corners, imaging in scattering media, as well as multiple camera time of flight system. Felix dissertation research has been published as first author papers in multiple nature scientific reports, seven ACM talk and SIGGRAPH papers, two CVPR oral papers, two optics express articles, plus five patterns and many, many more secondary author paper where he has made significant contributions. 
I'm pleased to present the ACM SIGGRAB Outstanding Doctoral Dissertation Award to Felix Haide. Thank you very much for the uh, very kind introduction. This um, award is a, really a reflection of everyone that has supported me um, thus far. And um, first and foremost, I'd like to thank my parents, my grandparents, and my brother, who always have um, supported me to follow my interests, even if that was hard for them. So I'd like to thank them wholeheartedly for that. This award is really also a very bright reflection of the ideas of my supervisor, Wolfgang Heidrich, who I'd like to thank um, extremely for all what he's done for me so far. And um, also my many collaborators that have um, been part of this long journey to this um, dissertation. And especially it's um, Gordon Wettstein, Matthias Hulin, um, Douglas Landman, uh, James Gregson, and um, Lei Chow, um, only among few that I'd like to um, point out here explicitly. So this award, although I'm receiving it, is really for you. So thank you very much. SIGGRAPH gives out three technical awards each year, the Significant New Researcher Award, uh, the Achievement Award, and the Stephen A. Coons Award, uh, Stephen A. Coons Award on odd number years, including this year. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce Bernd Bickel as this year's Significant New Researcher Awardee. Bernd received his master's and PhD from the ETH in Zurich, where he also worked as a research scientist at Disney Research. His research spans multiple disciplines, including fabrication, material science, biomechanics, and animation. Bern introduced novel techniques for multi-scale facial geometry capture. His contributions towards facial animation include pose space animation and detail transfer, as well as facial cloning using an animatronic character. He's also made core contributions in the design of fabricated objects, and I think you'll see some of that work at this year's SIGGRAPH. He's modeled their structural and mechanical properties and their optical appearance. These include models for flexible rod meshes, inflatable structures, planar rod structures, flexible shells, as well as fabrication methods to create moving characters. These characters can walk, automata articulated characters, actuated deformable characters. In appearance models, Berndt has used 3D printing to create spatially varying BRDFs and translucent materials. He's currently an assistant professor at the IST in Austria. For his extensive contributions at such an early stage of his career, we are pleased to present the significant new researcher award to Berndt Bickel. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, I feel very honored uh, to receive this award. I want to thank all of you. Being part of this community is really a great experience. I want to say, thank especially a few individuals with whom I would not stand here. First and foremost, my PhD advisor, Markus Gross, who introduced me to graphics and supported me over all those years. I also want to thank Wojtek Matusik, whom I met as an intern 12 years ago at Merle and since then has been my mentor and one of my closest collaborators. I also want to acknowledge my, all my other collaborators and PhD students, in particular, Mark Alexa, Miguel Otadui, Mario Botsch, Hans-Peter Pfister, Moritz Becher, Tabo Behler, Bernhard Tomaszewski, and Stelian Koros. I also want to thank IST Austria, Disney Research, and ETH Zurich for the excellent working conditions and the vi vibrant environment that they provide. Finally, I want to thank my family and especially my partner Martina for her encouragement, support, and patience, especially before SIGGRAF deadlines. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to introduce Ramesh Raskar as our awardee of this year's Computer Graphics Achievement Award. Ramesh has made many seminal contributions to computer graphics and computational imaging over the past two decades, 
with work spanning a wide range of problems, including transient imaging, light field displays, and augmented reality. Ramesh and colleagues pioneered new techniques in constructing light field displays that, that exhibit three-dimensional graphics without requiring the viewer to wear any special glasses. One very exciting application of light field display on phones is a low-cost technique to measure human refractive error and to be able to prescribe eyeglasses right off a mobile device. This is especially useful in places where specialized equipment is too expensive and then inaccessible to a local population. One of his presentations that really uh, sent chills down my spine was when he demonstrated a, a method to actually see light propagating through an environment. He was able to slow it down uh, by using extreme slow motion. The technique uses femtosecond lasers and street cameras to observe particular instances in time when combined allow us to see that light actually propagating and bouncing off objects and through uh, uh, various kinds of media. Ramesh has made significant contributions in a number of other areas, including projector-based augmented reality, non-photorealistic rendering, motion deblurring, and visual markers for augmented reality. I've known Ramesh for quite a long time, I think about 20 years, uh, since he arrived as a graduate student at UNC Chapel Hill, where he received his PhD in 2002. He's currently an associate professor at the MIT Media Lab and is also conducting special projects at Facebook. ACM SIGGRAPH is delighted to present the Computer Graphics Achievement Award to Ramesh Maskar, Raskar in recognition of his pioneering contributions to the fields of com computational photography and light transport and for applying these techniques for social impact. Ramesh. Thank you, Michael, for just a, such a generous introduction. I started my internship with Michael about 20 years ago in Microsoft Research. Uh, I really want to thank my loving family who's here, uh, my collaborators and friends at uh, UNC Chapel Hill, especially my co-advisors, Henry Fuchs and, and Greg Welch, uh, and my uh, uh, friends at Merle, uh, and MIT, uh, and at Facebook. Um, I think what's amazing right now is that you know, the world is really our lab, whether it's our environment, whether our life around us uh, and also inside our body. Uh, I'm very delighted to see social impact uh, being mentioned as part of this citation uh, because I feel like SIGGRAPH itself is going through phases. In the beginning, it was about learning. How can we learn in the sandbox of entertainment and gaming? Over time, we learned to apply you know, machine learning and optics and signal processing and graph theory. And now we are entering a third phase of how can we have an impact on the whole world and have a global awareness. So I'm really delighted <clears throat> to accept this award and want to thank all my collaborators who spent, as you know, the last 20 years with me, missing out on their Christmas vacation and New Year's vacation working on, working on SIGGRAPH papers. Thank you very much. And lastly, I'm very excited to be able to introduce Jessica Hodgins as this year's winner of the Stephen A. Coons Award. I've known Jessica for even longer than Ramesh, I guess, probably about 30 years, uh, ever since she was developing hopping robots at her lab at MIT. With this knowledge in hand, she had the audacity to use first principles to actually drive animation of characters. 26 years ago, in 1991, she brought a stampede of virtual creatures that walked, hopped, and ran onto the stage with her at SIGGRAPH. In 2000, Jessica joined the faculty at CMU, where she still serves as a professor today. She was also one of the founders of Disney Research. In both roles, she has been a generous and dedicated member to numerous students, postdocs, and junior faculty, at least when she was not attending to her wonderful menagerie of koi in her pond at her home. Jessica has also been a constant supporter of the graphics community. She and I can tell you many stories about founding the ACM SIGGRAPH Eurographic Symposium on Computer Animation. She has served as editor-in-chief of ACM TOG. She was, a, she was on the technical papers chair for SIGGRAPH, where she was instrumental in introducing author rebuttals to the paper review process. And if that was not enough, she continues to serve on the SIGGRAPH Executive Committee. 
ACM SIGGRAPH is proud to recognize Jessica Hodgins as this year's winner of the Stephen A. Coons Award for her foundational work in character animation, her mentorship of many young researchers, and for her extensive service to the computer graphics community. Jessica. So thank you so much for this award. It means a tremendous amount to me. I'd, I'd like to thank my parents uh, for allowing me to be an experimentalist from a very early age and for encouraging my interest in dynamic balance. Uh, in fact, I've spent most of the last 30 years trying to understand dynamic balance as well as other physical interactions, uh, from trying to figure out how this robot can perform a forward flip, uh, throwing its nose downward, spinning around, and uh, catching itself uh, using running algorithms. To trying to understand the physical interactions that occur in between the joints uh, here, we had a very patient subject who was willing to let us put 400 motion capture markers on him uh, and then perform uh, so that we could understand more about how the body moves. And finally, to some work that was presented this morning uh, by Lee Bin Liu, uh, where we used motion capture data to construct control fragments that could then be learned uh, to be resequenced so that this character uh, could perform on this bongo board, touching down, recovering from uh, the collisions with the ground, and to skateboard in turn in various directions. I'd like to thank a few of the mentors who have been very important to me in my career. Mark Rabert, my PhD thesis advisor, Turner Witted, Jim Foley, and Ed Catmull. Each of you have given me critical advice at very important times in my career, and I thank you for that. And finally, I've had a wonderful, um, uh, the wonderful honor of being part of many uh, teams with a vision for advancing the field in computer graphics and robotics. The CMU and MIT Leg Lab, the Georgia Tech Animation Lab, Disney Research, and the CMU Graphics Lab. I went back and looked at my CV, and it turns out that the last time I had a sole authored paper was in 1991. Uh, so I collected up the photos of my uh, collaborators in the meantime, uh, and it doesn't fit on one slide. <laughs> it doesn't even fit on two slides. <laughs> So here are all my collaborators, and I would like to thank them very much. I certainly couldn't have done any of this work without them. So thank you. So I'd like to ask all the award winners to stand. And let's give them one more round of applause. They only got a short time to, to thank their collaborators here, but I want you to all come at 2 o'clock today to room 152, where each of them will give a, a longer talk on their work, their inspirations, and their guidance and, and uh, wisdom for all of you out there who may one day have the opportunity to come up here and receive one of these awards. So come on out to room 152 today, and uh, thank you very much. Let's give a big round of applause to all the award winners once again. As a special treat, we have invited an extraordinary guest to introduce our keynote speaker. 
Since I am the 44th conference chair and the first African American, we thought it would be fitting if the first African American president of the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences, or the Oscars, was here with us today. She is a trailblazer. She is currently serving her fourth term as president of the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences, where she is only the third female and the first African American to hold this position. She is a respected motion picture marketing executive with more than 30 years of experience, a NAACP Hall of Fame inductee, a 2016 Rosa Parks Humanitarian Award winner, and most currently, the Will Rogers Motion Picture Pioneers Foundation 2017 Pioneer of the Year for her incredible work at the Academy. Please welcome Ms. Cheryl Boone Isaacs. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much, Jerome. Thank you very much. It's such a pleasure to be here. And it's what a great turnout, you guys. This is very impressive, terrific. And it's special to be here at SIGGRAPH 2017 as you celebrate your 44th year bringing this industry together. But it is even more meaningful to be here today to introduce someone celebrating his 82nd year and who has dedicated more than 60 years to helping to bring all of us together, Mr. Floyd Norman. Everyone should know Floyd's story because so many of us stand upon his shoulders. In 1945, Jackie Robinson broke baseball's color barrier. In 1948, President Truman ordered the military desegregation. In 1954, Brown versus Board of Education said that separate but equal in public education wasn't equal at all. And in 1956, a decade before the Civil Rights Act, a 21-year-old artist from Santa Barbara, California, broke the color barrier in the world of animation. Floyd Norman was Walt Disney's Jackie Robinson. And Floyd didn't just pave the way for others to finally have a seat at the table. He proved that he belonged at that table. And he proved he knew how to set that table with unforgettable classics. Once, he was handpicked by Walt Disney himself to join the story team for The Jungle Book. Floyd never, ever stopped. From Sleeping Beauty to Toy Story 2 to Monsters, Inc. and Out of Retirement for Mulan. No, Floyd never stopped from starting a multicultural website to present the full mosaic of African-American images to America's kids, to sticking around that cubicle at Disney because the words mandatory retirement age don't mean a thing to a man on a mission. Ladies and gentlemen, the film celebrating Floyd Norman may be called an animated life, but it could just as easily be called an American life. It is a life that has given so much to America and to each of us. A friend, a mentor, a trailblazer, a visionary, and always an artist. Floyd's refusal to go gently into that good night of retirement was the reason his family and friends coined the phrase floitering. Floyd says he plans to die at the drawing board. Well, Floyd Norman, to do us all a favor and don't finalize those plans anytime soon. Keep on giving, keep on living, keep on leading, keep on floitering for the next generation. We're going to look at a little bit of the trailer for an animated life before I bring up Mr. Floyd Norman. 
look for the bare necessities, the simple People things. have often asked me, how did it feel about being the first African-American at Disney? Well, I wasn't even aware that I was an African-American. <laughs> I was another artist looking for a job. There's always rumors of black people in Disney. It's always like, no, I think there is one. I was told as a kid, you know, hey kid, well, you can't get a job at the Disney studio, you know, they, they, don't, they don't hire blacks. I don't know, people just assume that. And because I want to do it, I just went there and applied for a job, and I got it. And when they told me I'm going to be working on the Jungle Book, I thought, how am I going to do this? Now he's upstairs with Walt Disney, and they're asking him to do the hardest thing of all, which is be funny. Come on, Floyd, it would be funny. But Floyd made it possible for others to say, well, he can do it, I can do it. Now there's enough of us for us to be mad at each other. Hey, there you go. <laughs> there's a black guy that I don't like. I've been an animator, layout artist, storyboard artist, writer. There's no one who had worked with Walt Disney and then gone to publications and then ended up at Pixar. Every time there's a great moment in animation, look around, there's Floyd Norman. He's like the Forrest Gump of animation. The kid's good. He's only 79 years old. He's a very introverted, very humble on the outside guy. But the truth is he's iconoclastic and he's a troublemaker. I remember on Mulan he'd put out a book directed at the money-grubbing aspect of our industry. And some people got very upset by them. That guy's a bad guy. He's a troublemaker. Don't hire him. Hi there! Floyd says to us all, we could do better. That's part of what makes him a legend. Disney has been a part of his life forever. And when he turned 65, Disney told him, you're out of here. I've never seen him more devastated in his life. He was in his prime. They should not have let him go. Perfect. See, we're talking about racism an issue. Now ageism is a real big issue. He told me when I was a kid, I would never retire. He's the biggest kid I know. He loves the studio. That's what has kept him young. If you love that and that's your life, you're not going to be stopped. The old guys have been beaten down. So they needed somebody that's maybe retired who can go in and raise hell. Well, if you could press me wide on the past you left behind. What's the life you live one frame at a time? That might not even show up because I'm a retiree, so. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Floyd Norman. Thank you, Cheryl, for the introduction. My name is Steve Waskell with Waskell Entertainment, for those of you who don't know me. Floyd, so nice to have a chance to get you here and have my you is, at Sigra. My name is Floyd Norman. Your name is Floyd Norman, is right. it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, happy to be here. Happy to be here. So you've, you know, spanned so long in the animation industry that you've actually got an opportunity to work with a lot of the folks who started the whole industry, right? Very true. I came to uh, the Walt Disney Studio at an incredible time because a lot of the, a lot of the men and women who made the movies I saw as a child we're still working at Disney. So I had the opportunity, uh, myself and my colleagues, to learn from the masters, the people who really kind of invented this business. And then they taught it to all of us young kids. And now right. we're passing it on to the next generation. Yeah. So some of the, um, kind of one of the differences, I think, a lot of us appreciate animation. Sure. But then there's those who have a more sort of visceral response, probably a lot of folks in this audience. You know, they're the ones that would see something and then pick up a pad and start sketching, right? Right, right. So um, I think one of your early experiences was, um, it was um, Snow White, probably, right? No, no, I was... I was <laughs> oh, heck, not, not working on it, but seeing, I mean, uh, watching a feature. Oh, watching it, yeah, being, yeah. being uh, scared to death. <laughs> from that Disney movie, it, right. it terrified me. So you saw it in the theater, right? I saw it in the theater. And the funny part is, that, you know, Snow White was made when I was still a child. Right. Uh, but I ended up working on it, believe it or not. I actually worked on Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs because uh, the old man, uh, uh, Walt Disney, wanted to show a sequence that was not used in the final film. 
And so we dug the uh, drawings out of the morgue. This was back in 1956. And we cleaned up those drawings uh, of the soup eating sequence, a sequence that was not used in the final film. So we actually cleaned up those drawings so I can actually tell people I did work on Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs just many, many years later. Well, that's amazing. That's when you first started there, right? Yeah, back yeah. in 56, yeah. Wow. So for folks that are, you know, looking at the industry today, it's obviously much different than it was back then. You started sort of being in between. Uh, it was a much, uh, today yeah. it's a much more robust industry. Uh, back when I started, people regarded animation as barely a job. You know, when you told people you were going to work in animation, they would always say, have you considered a real job? How, how about your parents? How'd they react to that? My parents, thankfully, did not think I was crazy. And so when I said I wanted to work for Walt Disney, they were very supportive, especially my, my grandmother. I, I give a great deal of credit to uh, Emma Davis, my grandmother, who believed in my dream even more so than my parents. My grandmother got it, and she was extremely supportive. She helped me build my first animation camera stand. She really knew where this skinny young kid was headed. She got it. She understood when a lot of people didn't. So I owe a great deal to my grandmother, and I was able to tell her uh, she was dying of cancer in Santa Barbara, and I was able to go to her bedside and tell her back in 1956 that I had been hired by the Walt Disney Studios oh, wow. and that I had, you know, that dream that she shared with me, that dream had come true. That's pretty incredible. Yeah, it was really quite special, yeah. So with that animation stand, what kind of animations were you making? Just interesting. I started out making cartoons when I was a kid in junior high school because I just wanted to do it. And back then there was precious little animation. There were no books on animation with the exception of Walter T. Foster there was one book that sold for around $12 at the art supply stores on how to make animated cartoons. So with that book, that was the only uh, textbook I had on how to make cartoons. And basically I taught myself how to animate, how to paint cells, and how to shoot those uh, pieces of art one frame at a time uh, under the animation camera. So, uh, and then I found out years later that a lot of my friends and colleagues who wanted to be animators did the very same thing we were basically self-taught. We taught ourselves how to animate because there were no schools teaching animation. When I enrolled at Art Center College of Design uh, after high school, uh, I was an illustration major. The reason I studied advertising illustration and illustration in general was because there was no animation class. I had to teach, we had to teach ourselves how to be animators because you know no schools taught it. No schools I was aware of at the time. Right. So my real education in animation didn't really begin until I was hired at the Walt Disney Studios. Yeah. And then we were mentored by the masters of this medium. They taught us how to be animators. So, and, and then for the audience, Walt Disney Studios was a lot different than the Walt Disney or you know, Disney we think of today. Oh, right? incredible, yeah, a lot yeah. smaller. A lot smaller. A lot smaller, even though the studio was going through an amazing growth spurt back in the 1950s. Walt Disney was not only making short cartoons and feature films, they had gone into television with a weekly show, Disneyland, a daily show, the Mickey Mouse Club. Plus they were doing live action. They were shooting overseas and in the UK. And it was just an incredible time. They had just opened a theme park in Anaheim. So it was an amazing time to be at Disney. Yeah. Even though looking back on it, it looks like small potatoes today. It was just an amazing time to be at the Walt Disney Studio. And I came to the studio not as a uh, pioneer. I was just another kid looking for a job in animation because I loved the medium of uh, filmmaking, storytelling, and animating. Yeah. So how did it feel being able to be with, like you had many, many interactions with Walt himself and all the you know, fabulous you know, legends, really, <laughs> um, that were there. And, you know, in particular, seeing the, the risks they would take. I mean, I don't know the audience how familiar they are with Walt, but 
he took incredible risks and you know the company was on the edge so many yeah. times right it's not the disney we think of today it's just yeah, so, yeah yeah most people don't realize how close the disney studio was to failure multiple times multiple times yes. yeah many many times uh, walt and roy had to pull the fat out of the fire time and time again and by the time i got there uh, things were you know things were moving up you know things were looking good for disney but they had to survive uh the war, which cut their, their uh, film income in half when World War II broke out. Then they were hit by uh, labor action in the early 40s. That nearly killed the studio. So by the time Walt and Roy managed to survive to the 1950s, they had been through a lot. And there was almost no Disney studio. Uh, many, many times the studio could have gone under, yeah. but managed to survive. So. I have to give the old man credit for taking risk after risk because, you know, most people would have given up. But Walt Disney was used to uh, being battered and hammered, and he knew how to come back. And I had to give the old man credit for his tenacity, for his resilience. He was uh, an innovator, and he was a brilliant man. Uh, a very simple man, but uh, a brilliant man. Yeah. How did that impact you? Did you realize at the time... You know, these icons of the industry that, you know, being able to, for example, come in on a weekend and be able to hang out with the guys or after work, the little tidbits you would get from them. I mean, how, how has oh, that yeah. impacted your life? Well, for all of us kids who came to the studio at that time, we had the opportunity to learn from the true masters of animation. These were the men and women who built this business. I mean, keep in mind, they started out in the 1930s. A lot of them hadn't even been to college, you know. They were, they were kids who worked in the neighborhood. Uh, Walt would hire guys, you know, and, and girls in the Silver Lake District and, and bring them into the studio to become artists or to learn how to become animation artists. Uh, you know, guys who worked at the local drugstore and who had jobs around, around that area of Los Angeles would come to the Disney studio to work on this strange thing called animation and try to make a, a living at it. And uh, Walt knew how to select talent. He was very good at knowing what a person was good at doing. And so guys like Wilfred Jackson that Walt selected to be an animator, Walt eventually promoted Jackson to be a director because Walt knew this guy could direct. Jackson had never gone to film school. He didn't know anything about directing. But Disney saw in him that this guy had the potential to be a good director, and uh, Wilfred Jackson directed many, many Disney films. But that's the kind of guy Walt was. He could spot talent, and he would bring in these people and put them to work. Uh, it was an amazing time to be in animation because basically they were creating a business from scratch. Yeah. Oh, they, right, exactly. Before that, there was not. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, there was no real animation business. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, there were short cartoons being made, theatricals. But nobody had the kind of ambition Walt Disney had to take this thing further, to do feature-length films, to uh, Well, that push. was the gutsy move. Oh, it was, and yeah. to push the technology. Uh, yeah. When I spoke at Apple uh, a year or so ago, I was telling them that, uh, you know, innovation in animation didn't begin recently. Uh, Walt was animating back in the, uh, innovating back in the 1930s with things like going into color, uh, the development of the multiplane camera, all of these incredible technologies uh, Disney pioneered because he pushed his people, his artists, and his technicians to do that much better than the other studios were doing. So, yeah. Right, and so for the younger folks in the audience, if you're using a compositing program with all those layers, right. the multiplane camera <laughs> was a huge thing, right? You'd shoot through to build up your, your animation, right? Yeah, to well, you composite know. Composite everything, but on... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We had to use the technology uh, of our day. And when Ward Kimball was doing those amazing space films, uh, Man in Space, uh, yeah, Mars and Beyond, Man in the Moon, uh, our people were just amazing what they were doing with, you know, analog. They right. didn't, we didn't have the, uh, the <laughs> we didn't have digital. And all of those camera moves and all of that compositing was done the old fashioned way. Uh, opticals, uh, bipack in the camera. Uh, we had to, it was really nuts and bolts filmmaking, and Disney was able to do incredible things 
with the uh, technology we had at that time. So it was a great time to be at Disney. And uh, we were a long, long way away from, uh, you know, the digital world we live in today. But even with the, uh, you know, the nuts and bolts we had back then, uh, Walt did amazing things with the tools of the 1950s and 1960s. Yeah. Amazing stuff. So how did it feel when you were, um, if I understand his reputation um, yeah. properly, he could be very um, certain of what he liked and exactly. what he didn't like, right? Exactly. So were there, your more interaction with him on that kind of a level was more when you got into doing story side of things or was it actually as an animator as well? No, not at all as an animator. Yeah. Walt's on the focus story side. was story. And that's where he focused all of his attention. He knew he had the best in the business when it came to animators. When it came to layout artists, background artists, he had the best. But he wasn't worried about that. He wasn't worried about that. He focused on storytelling. So you didn't really deal with Walt Disney unless you were in the story department. Well, imagine how terrified I was when in 1966, I was told by my boss to move upstairs to the story department. Right. You didn't even want that job I didn't. I never, right? I never applied for the job. I didn't even want the job. <laughs> and, uh, and my boss calls me in and says, okay, move up to uh, 2C on the second floor of the animation building. You're going to be working with Walt Disney on the Jungle Book. A lot of people would have looked at that as an incredible job opportunity. Yeah. I looked at it with sheer terror. <laughs> Keep in mind, I was a kid still in my 20s, yeah. and I'm going to be working with Walt Disney on the job. Amazing, book. huh? You know, it was, uh, you know, it, it was a pretty daunting task. But, yeah. you know, when Walt makes a request, well, it's not really a request. It's a demand. Right. And there's only one answer, and that answer is yes, sir. Yes. So pick up your stapler, pick up all your stuff, and move your office up, right? Yeah, and your ashtray. And your ashtray, yeah. that's right. <laughs> That's, one of the, that's a different thing, right, for everybody here? Yeah, we had ashtrays in those days. Yeah, I think that's well, one of the things you got. You'd get a stapler, you get an ashtray, and yeah. a few other things, right? When yeah, you, you don't get those anymore. Yeah. Because nobody smokes today. Yeah, that's a good yeah. thing. Yeah. Really. <laughs> um, so it's interesting that the live action part of Disney at that time, along with the animation from a storytelling perspective, kind of looking back in those days. Yeah. Do you think you could tell more in the animation world than you could with the live action or, or even the films that were being done? Well, you know, I was fascinated with, with uh, movie making, with storytelling. It, it didn't really matter to me uh, whether the film was live action or animation. Uh, all of it fascinated me. I do think that as an animation filmmaker, you have uh, a good deal more control over, uh, over your film, over your, your image, you can do that much more because you, you have more control. In live action, it's, it's, well, you know, anybody who's made a live action film knows there are a lot of things that are almost beyond your control. You try to control it as best you can, but making a live action film is kind of like jumping on a runaway train. You know, you, <laughs> you run to catch up with it, jump, jump, jump on the train, and then hang on for dear life because the film almost drags you along and you're trying to control it. Uh, with animation, you have a good deal more control. You're not thinking in terms of just footage. You're thinking in terms of the individual film. Now, today, a lot of live action films are almost animated films because there's so much digital technology, <laughs> you know, in, a, in every frame of, of a film. You're not quite sure if you're watching a live action film or an animated film. It's almost one and the same. That's how much technology has, you know, how much it's a part of our business today. But, you know, I love them both. I, I, I still love the magic of filmmaking. I love when I walked onto my first sound stage at the Walt Disney Studio. It was stage two, and they were shooting a movie. And it just knocked me out because I was so excited to be on a movie sound stage. But I loved animation as well. And I think as an animated filmmaker, and then having the opportunity to work in story, once again, a job I, di I didn't want. <laughs> but a job that was, in a sense, dropped into my lap, uh, I began to appreciate what an incredible opportunity I had to tell stories using the medium of animation because you can do so much. You can impact the audience in a very profound way. You know, you can do incredible things like our film Toy Story 2 where we were able to deal with such adult themes 
and basically, what's a ki it's a kid's film. It's a, it's a kid's movie, and yet we were able to take this metaphor of mortality with toys and, and tell a very compelling story. That's what I love about this medium. You can do so much with it. Yeah. Yeah, it's an incredible medium. So you've always been a proponent of the technology side of the... Yeah, I love the technology. Yeah. I always it, have. It, yeah. Isn't it true that while well, everybody at Disney kind of sort of, you know, get back from technology, you had like a Commodore 64 or something on your uh, I brought my f I brought a Macintosh into my department uh, in the early 80s. Uh -huh. uh, Apple had just shipped the first Mac, and I brought this computer, and I put it on my desk, and everybody walked around and looked at it and it was it was like this odd thing what is this <laughs> thing doing on your desk what are you going to do with that what are you going to do with it and i said it's a computer and they said well what can you do with that <laughs> I, now, what did you tell them true story the executives at yeah. disney said a computer what can you do with a computer right that's when i realized well you're not going to have your job very long <laughs> <laughs> what was your first experience with the computer well, was it that machine or was it? Believe it or not, I began, I was, at the time I was writing the Mickey Mouse comic strip. Okay. And so I started writing. That's where you're doing the story for it, right? Well, I was, yeah, I was writing. I, it was the, the, the newspaper syndicated strip. Okay, for Mickey Mouse. So for Mickey Mouse, and I was, I was, I was writing Mickey with a mouse, basically. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> right. Yeah, well, yeah. And you never got in trouble doing that. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. Well, nobody really. And then yeah. it's really funny because then some of our young executives up, upstairs, I have to say young executives because they saw the future, and they began to send their secretaries down to use my, my computer. Oh, right. Uh, <laughs> one guy, a uh, young guy, his name was Steve Burke. He's done all right for, him, for himself, uh, Steve Burke. Uh, I think he runs Comcast now. And the other guy, the other guy who sent his secretary down to use my computer was uh, Michael Linton. And yeah. I think he runs a company called Sony. I was hoping so, he would do so, better. Whatever happened well, you know, with so, that? Right? So, you know, so the guys who, who saw the computer and got it were the guys I knew were going to go somewhere in this Interesting. business. Interesting. Yeah. So you're a big proponent of it from day one. You saw the possibility. Oh, they yeah, were, yeah. They were different then, I mean, compared to what everybody here today has access to, obviously. Yeah. But at the time, it was just thrilling for people to, who are using them, right? Oh, yeah. And, and there wasn't a good deal you could do with uh, the technology at that time because the uh, computers were small and underpowered. But I knew that one day the computer, that that technology would mature right. and we would be able to do great things with it. Mm -hmm. Well, before I knew it, it was 1994, and a little company called Pixar was making their first animated feature film, Toy Story. Well, I saw that coming. It's yeah. just that it took a while to, uh, you know, to reach that point. It took a while for the technology to mature. And but uh, you, you saw some of the story before it came I out, saw, right? Yeah, I saw the story reels on Toy Story in 1994. And all I could think of was, holy smokes, what is this? And who is doing this? I want to work with these guys. Yeah, because it looked and, a lot different, didn't it? I mean, compared to what you've seen to that point. Well, you mean in terms of traditional versus computer filmmaking? Yeah, I mean, it was sort of a step beyond. Well, the, the, the tools were different. The storytelling right. is exactly That's the same. That's the same, the storytelling. But the look the of storytelling was exactly the same. The guys at Pixar were making a feature-length animated motion picture, but they were still using basic Disney storytelling. And that's why the film resonated with me so profoundly, because I knew I could do this stuff. We're just working with new tools. We're just working, instead of pencil and paper, we're working with, with computer technology. But we're still going to tell a story. We're still going to reach an audience the way Walt Disney had back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Now, in the 90s, we were going to tell stories the same way, just using new technology. Right using new tools, I knew I had to work for Pixar. And thank God that they invited me to come up and this work, for on, Toy Story too, then? work on Toy Story 2. Wow, so what did you, you work on the story part there? How's that again? You're working on the story part? I'm working there? on story, yeah. yeah. They, uh, our producer, Ralph Guggenheim, uh, came down to Disney one, one afternoon and invited, invited me up to, to Pixar. I, I, at the time, I, I thought of Ralph as a movie producer I didn't realize this guy was a heavyweight <laughs> in technology. 
He right. had worked for George Lucas, developing Edit Droid for George Lucas. And then when uh, Steve Jobs bought Pixar from Lucas, and then Ralph became a producer and was one of the uh, producers on Toy Story. So I, I didn't learn a lot about uh, Ralph until a good deal later when I said, holy smokes, this guy's not just a movie producer, he's a technologist and an incredible one at that. So it was very exciting being at Pixar. And of course, it was cool having access to Steve Jobs. Uh, I think that was probably why I went to Pixar in the first place. So if you had so a, I could a, meet Steve. <laughs> a tech support question, you'd go, hey, Steve, there's something wrong with my computer here. Hey, who better to get tech support from if you've got an Apple problem, who better? Just call Steve. Just call Steve Jobs. There you go. Because, because he runs the company. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I never tried. Anybody here tried that before? Anybody in the audience? <laughs> Steve was a very cool dude. I mean, I liked the guy very much. Yeah. In many ways, Steve Jobs was a lot like Walt Disney. Both very uh, demanding, both opinionated, both believed there was only one way to do things, and that was their way. But I have no problem with that. I have no problem with a, uh, a leader right. taking charge. And even though uh, both guys were very demanding uh, individuals, uh, I don't have any problem working for somebody who wants the very best and will settle for nothing less than the very best. Yeah. Well, I've talked to a lot of uh, folks who are doing visual effects, for example. Right. And you could spend, people here will know this, but uh, weeks and weeks on a single shot that might go past a film very, very quickly. You bet. And I asked some of them, do you go see the films? And some do, some don't, which <laughs> surprised me. Were you the kind of guy that would always go see the films when they came out that you worked on? I would go see the films mainly because I wanted the audience reaction. You wanted to see how they were reacting. I wanted to see how the audience reacts because bottom line, for myself as a storyteller, I want to know if I'm connecting with the audience. I want to know if the film is resonating with them. That's what I'm really concerned about. Basically, the technology, wh wh whatever that happens to be, be it analog or digital, that kind of takes care of itself. But the storytelling is something, that's the hard part. Telling a compelling story, connecting with an audience, the one thing Walt Disney taught us as young storytellers, he said, don't watch the movie, watch the audience. You know, So that's how I learned as a storyteller, by observing the audience. That way you know if your film is working or if you're failing. Uh, you'll know soon enough because the audience will tell you. Yeah, <laughs> so you'll hear the reaction. You'll, yeah, you'll, you'll get their reaction or their non-reaction. So yeah. yeah, that's how you learn. Well, that's a great way to, to do it, right? Actually it is. Experience it with the audience. Exactly. The, there, there's no that. better way. So I don't go to see a film because I'm, you know, the, once a film is over, generally I'm sick of it because I've been on the film sometimes for, uh, you know, a number of years. In exactly. the case of Toy Story, Toy Story 2, that is, we started in 1997. We didn't really finish the film until 1999. So you kind of live with these projects for a number of months and a number of years. By the time it's done, you're pretty much sick of it. Yeah. But, but you're proud of it. It's your baby. But you do go see it, not because you want to see this marvelous thing you've created. You want to see how the audience responds to it, whether or not you've succeeded in touching the audience. Because yeah. that's, that's critical in what we do. We're storytellers. Right. You know, we have to communicate. And that's really what it's all about. You know. How does all that effort feel when you're in the theater and the things that you guys thought would work just worked magnificently. What's, what's the feeling like oh, at that moment? Man, there's nothing better than that. That's the best feeling in the world, you know? Yeah. For me, I'm a gagster, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to sprinkle as many gags in the film as I can because I know the audience is going to laugh. People will often ask me, how do you know it's funny? How do you know the audience is going to laugh? You just know, if you're a funny person, if you're a gagster, you know what's funny. And so when I plug in these gags, like for instance, I had these gags in Toy Story 2 where, uh, you know, they're in the toy store and, 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 and Barbie suddenly appears and I know everybody's going to respond. Tour guide Barbie, right? Tour guide Barbie. You, you know, hey, that's, you, can't, you can't miss on this one. And so 
I put in all these Barbie gags, and the gags are funny, so I say, hey, put in more Barbie gags. Because, yeah. you know, you get a bigger laugh. And so I love doing stuff like that. But for me, humor is just kind of intuitive. Uh, like I said, I'm just a gagster anyway, and so I, I love to have fun throwing these gags in. And then when I go to the movie theater, I'll go in just to see if the audience is going to laugh at my gag again. And they laugh every time. And that, may, that makes you feel really good. Oh, I bet, yeah. <laughs> So for some of the younger folks in the audience, um, there's all kinds of software applications. And right. It's pretty uh, easy um, to become technically proficient in how to utilize them with all the, not time to take away from it, it takes years to be a, like a Maya expert, okay? But, yeah. But you can get training that you didn't have available. It was like a, the one book, right? Um, but when you're talking to them about, because you do talk to students quite a bit, yeah, and, and, about and what they need to succeed, employees. right? Because when right. I'm, I'm looking at it and I talk to students, I'm always saying, well, it's great. You want to be technically competent. You want to be the best at what you do. Right. But my advice has always been you want to be able to get along with people sure. right, and be part of a team. Right. But you've got a lot more experience. Um, what would you say to some of the younger folks who are trying to, you know, get into the business, yeah. or that are just, you know, in companies right now, trying to move their careers along? Yeah. Well, you know, we're all collaborators, and uh, filmmaking is a collaborative effort. It always has been, and so whether you're working at the Disney Studio in the 1940s or 50s, or whether you're working at Pixar present day, you are still collaborating. And I think that's what I love about this amazing business. You, you are working with many, many different people. People who have different strengths. People who are stronger at, at writing or telling stories. People who are stronger in the technical areas. It's great to sit down and work with these guys, you know, because everybody brings something to the table. Some people bring their knowledge of art and design. Some people bring their ability at storytelling. Some people, uh, they're technical in, uh, innovations, you know, a guy like uh, Oren Jacob up at Pixar that I work with on Toy Story 2. You're working with this incredible group of men and women who are so darn good at what they do, either as artists or as techs or as just guys who are just good at ideas. And when you pool all this talent together, you can create something marvelous. And that's what I love about this business. I sat down at a table with uh, a bunch of young story artists, young men and women. This was just last year on a, a visit to Pixar. And these were all kids. I mean, I call them kids because they were like my age back when I came into story, <laughs> you know, in our 20s. And these young men and women are all story artists, story trainees at Pixar Animation Studios. And now I'm the gray-haired old-timer but it's so great to be with these kids and talk about what they're doing and the films they're developing because, you know, I'm sharing my life and my experience with them, the things I've learned from the story masters who came before me. Now I'm able to pass it on to these young kids who are doing their thing and who are creating new stories that you will be seeing in the coming years, coming out of Pixar Animation Studios, coming out of Disney, a new generation of storytellers doing their thing as I did mine back on the Jungle Book back in, way back in 1966. Well, what do you think, following up on that, what do you think about uh, VR, AR, and the, for this younger generation that has all these tools coming out, like daily guys, right? Yeah. Um, what do you think about storytelling and kind of how that is going to shake out. I, you know. Yeah, funny you should mention that because right across the hallway from me are a bunch of young men and women who are developing something, a uh, virtual reality platform that they're working with. And I don't know exactly what they're doing because they're hard at work, but they'll often come over uh, in our coffee room and share a cup of coffee and a donut. And I always remind them that you guys are working with all this cool technology, but realize you've got to serve the story. It's the content that's important because that's what the audience responds to. Yeah, the technology is cool, and they're going to say, whoa, that's really cool technology. But ultimately, if the story doesn't work, if you're not engaging an audience with you know, a compelling story, mm -hmm. then the technology is not going to save you because you know, the tech is cool, 
But that but, wears off, maybe. It, yeah, the story is what you take home with you. The character, the stories, this is what lives with you as uh, these Disney films that live on now and are watched by generation after generation. These films never die. They never grow old because the content is always solid. The technology changes. The technology grows and matures, but the storytelling never changes. A good story that was told 40 years ago or today remains a good story. Mm -hmm. And so, once again, the tech has to serve the content. What do you, let's say, when is the last time you actually went back and watched one of the cartoons or shorts or long you know, yeah. features from when you were really young and, and kind of now that you've been in the industry for so long and you look at the film differently perhaps, right? it still holds up the story, but yeah. what do you think of it? Let's say if you went back and you watched that very spooky Snow yeah. White. <laughs> The very terrifying Snow White. Very terrifying <laughs> Snow White. My mom took me to see Snow White when I was a little kid. And I'll tell you, that, that film scared the dickens out of me. Yeah. And I, I told Walt Disney that. I mean, I, <laughs> this is the, people, people look at Snow White and the Seven Doors as a children's film. It scares the dickens out of little kids. It sure scared me. But uh, I, I think Walt thought, I guess there's nothing wrong with scaring kids. <laughs> it, it, it prepares them for life, I guess, you know. <laughs> life, is, life is going to be scary, so you might as well be scared watching a cartoon. Yeah. Get, get ready for it. So when you're watching it now, though, do you find yourself looking at the animation differently? Uh, or you just, you just get lost in the story and you don't I'm amazed, think about it? I'm how. amazed at how well it works. I'm amazed at how well it holds up that I, I look at a picture like, again, we're going back to Walt Disney, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, made in the 1930s. Yeah. It plays incredibly well today. It's still a good, solid film today. And that's because the storytelling is solid. The characterizations are solid. Uh, the film lives as much today as it did back in 1938 when it was released. It's a, it's a darn good film and it's a darn good story. And so we strive as filmmakers today to make a film as good as the one Walt made back in, 19, back in the 1930s. Yeah. You know? And uh, I think that's what's so amazing about these films. For me, they never grow old. Uh, I look back at them. I learn from them. I continually learn from Pinocchio, from Bambi, from all of those classics I saw as a child. Yeah. Uh, those films continue to teach me today because I just love the fact that these stories are so tight. Uh, there's no waste. There's no excess. Everything that's there needs to be there. What doesn't need to be there is removed. I think Walt was such a great story editor. He, he knew the essence of a story. He knew what to leave in. He knew what to take out. And that's why it was such a, a pleasure and an honor to work with the old man on the Jungle Book because I learned so much from him. This is like a master class in storytelling and you're learning from a master firsthand. Over a course of years though, which is amazing, right? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I only had the opportunity to work with Walt on one movie. Oh, right, because, because you were Because doing... he passed right. away yeah. December of 1966. So right I only, at that time, yeah. Yeah, I only had one year with Walt Disney, but that year on the Jungle Book, that year of being in meetings with Walt Disney, for me as a kid, and is still in his 20s, it was an incredible time because yeah. I was learning from a master, you know, learning the, the tricks and the tools of the trade firsthand. And at the time, I was a dumb kid. I didn't think that much about it. I look back on that time now, what an incredible opportunity I had. The Disney studio employed hundreds of artists and technicians, hundreds. There were maybe a dozen people who sat in that room with Walt Disney. A dozen people, and I was one of them. That was an incredible opportunity. I mean, you know, I could not have wished for anything better. Right. And yet, you know, I had this... Your you know, grandmother was smiling at you then, huh? You bet. Yeah. You bet she was, yeah. Absolutely. An incredible time. But then we, we have a couple more minutes. Just for the audience, we have some microphones I want to mention. We're going to do a Q&A a little bit. So, um, not yet, but if you want to sort of think about questions you might like to ask, you can go ahead and stand behind the microphones up 
in the front. Yeah, try and stump me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you also got, okay, there's Disney, but then also like Hannah and Barbera. When I was a yeah. kid, I loved the cartoons they were producing. And, you know, it just was totally, like, remember? Yeah. Some of them were just totally different, and, and, <laughs> you know, than, than what else was different. Out. Yeah, different and, uh, and really incredibly stupid, but uh, incredibly we had stupid. fun. Yeah, we had fun. We had fun. I, honestly, we had fun at Hanna-Barbera. Uh, worked on a lot of uh, TV series, some of them great, some not so great, but we had a ball. Uh, totally different experience from Walt Disney, where we had lots of time, lots of money. When you work in television, uh, as we did in those days, uh, people often ask me, what's the biggest difference between working in TV and feature films? It's time and money. At Disney, we had lots of time, we had lots of money. Hanna-Barbera, we had no time and no money. And yet you, <laughs> you, you, still, have to create something. you still have to make a product. And so we did uh, Scooby-Doo, which uh, was a show that I... <laughs> A lot of and people like that show. A lot of people love Scooby. Yeah. Uh, people come up today and tell me how much they love Scooby-Doo. And I, I, uh, I grew to hate that dog. Did you? But, uh, <laughs> no, no Scooby but, but, snacks from uh, Floyd. <laughs> no. But, you know, we had a good time. And uh, Smurfs, the Flintstones, all of that stuff. You know, you probably Johnny Quest, which was kind of a that, cool show. Yeah, I know. For Anybody here know Johnny Quest? Do you guys know that? Is anybody yeah. old enough to know Johnny Quest? <laughs> and for those of you who are clapping, how many would actually look forward to Saturday morning just to see that? Right? Yeah. I, I have five brothers, and we yeah. couldn't wait to see Johnny Quest. But was Johnny morning. Quest running prime time? I thought it was an evening show. Because I think the yeah, network... It's been too long to remember for... I think they yeah. ran it in prime time on its initial... Uh, Maybe I was watching Louise. it on the reruns. But they probably, oh, they probably ran it Saturday morning eventually anyway. Yeah. But yeah, it was a pretty cool show. Doug Wildey was my producer on that show. And uh, that was a great show. And, and, and people still remember it, and they remember it fondly. It wasn't like Rex and Haji. And Haji, yeah. Yeah. I.e. Dr. Quest. That's yeah. right. Yes. What is so, it, Doctor? Um, I don't know. I don't know, Race. I really don't know. That's right. Yeah. What could it be? <laughs> yeah. When you're looking at filmmaking now, yeah. um, I've just been fascinated by the camera rigs that you could have and you know, maybe combining those with some of the high-tech game engines and things yeah. and trying to do real-time uh, rendering you know, and how we're coming up with that. And also, you know, without getting to light field stuff even. Yeah. What do you think about that being able to... Because you've been on live action a lot and you've also done you know, the really methodical animation. Right. Being able to do something in sort of a game engine environment that would be you know, feature film quality but in real time. Yeah. From a story perspective and just the fun perspective of making a film. What, do you, yeah. what are your thoughts on that? Well, the tools we have today are just amazing. Just incredible. I, I come from an era of the, uh, the Mitchell B and C, you know, that monster camera we used to make live action films uh, at Disney back in the 1950s, 1960s, when the, the Mitchell was what everybody used. It's a huge camera, you know, it had this big blimp on it. It took a crew to move it around. And now <laughs> you look at the, the size of the, of the cameras today. Yeah. They can fit in your pocket. You know, and, and yet the quality is as good or better a fart than superior. the 35 millimeter negative uh, that was in, in the Mitchell back, back in the 1960s. Yeah. So I think the tech we have today is just amazing. And when I've gone out with film crews and we're shooting digital, I mean, I feel like sometimes this is science fiction because the tech has matured. We made such incredible progress. We can do so much more today with so much less. Uh, I'm just blown away. I, I was out on the soundstage at the Disney Studios just last week where they were shooting the show, and uh, I'm just amazed at the camera rigs we have today that gives you so much flexibility. Uh, you can do things we could not have imagined back in the 1960s where we would have to, you know, break away a wall just to get the camera through. <laughs> the camera was so massive, and how do you light the set? You know, you had to pour light on it and basically cook the actors because there's so much light on the right. set. Uh, today, you don't have to worry about that stuff. Today, the technology enables you to do so much more with so much less. Exactly. But it all has to serve the story, right? But it all serves the story, right. yeah, bottom line. 
So let's get our audience a, a moment to um, see. Do we have questions here? We have some folks in the back here. Why don't you go ahead? Yeah, hi. I know it was a few years ago, but um, do you have any details you could share about your interview at Disney, how you felt, or what kind of questions they asked? Uh, when I first came to Disney? Yeah, you, you remember. <laughs> I mean, do I remember what it was like? Yeah, uh, your interview, yeah. Oh, my interview? Yeah, yeah. No, uh, Disney was very generous with me. Uh, they interviewed me when I was just a kid right out of high school, and they gave me some excellent advice. And they told me to, kid, go to school and learn how to be an artist. And that was darn good advice because I enrolled at Art Center College of Design. And uh, I studied the basics, the fundamentals, you know, drawing, perspective, all of that good stuff. And I eventually uh, was hired at the Walt Disney Studio. But they were very generous. They were very gracious. They took the time to interview a young kid who was basically nobody. And uh, they were very nice to me, and they gave me good advice. So I'm very grateful for that interview with Disney. And lo and behold, a few years later, they called me back and offered me a job. So uh, I'm very grateful to the Disney company for the opportunity they gave me. Okay, thank you. Thank you. How about from this side of the room here? Hi, thank you for the great uh, story sharing. In my 20s, I'm just old enough to watch the 3D um, Jungle Book ah. not long ago. But you are part of making the uh, original Jungle Book in your 20s. That's great right. Work. Thanks. Yeah. Um, my question is that uh, you guys were talking about virtual reality. And um, you made a great point that uh, the story is always the core of uh, a movie. But the technology is just uh, helping it better and making it better. Right. Um, but um, actually, in VR, um, we are so immersed that we become part of the, the movie. We become a role in it. And also, we can control how we move, how, right. how we see different things. So it actually it's changing the, the way how the story is, is told. Um, the, the, the audience is more like an organic part of the movie. Um, yeah. is, uh, is Disney making some experiments in um, changing the way it's <laughs> telling the stories in VR? Yeah, uh, let me say that, that there's a lot of uh, things being done. Uh, I've had the opportunity to, to uh, because I work in the industry, so I've, uh, I can see what's happening at Disney. I can't tell you what they're doing because I <laughs> can't reveal any secrets yet. What about your competitors? Can you tell those? <laughs> <laughs> That's an excellent try. That's really good. That's really good. They've shown me some really cool stuff up at, uh, I, I was able to go up to Skywalker. Uh, last year and see some of the cool stuff they were doing and we're doing some cool things at Disney as well. So yeah, we're headed in that direction. I can't tell you exactly what we're doing, but we're really having uh, a good time with this new technology. And it's we are moving in a whole new direction and it's going to be very exciting. For all of you young people out there, uh, the future looks promising because there's a whole new world that's about to open up for all of you. And I hope to stick around long enough to see some of this cool stuff happen. So you're right, it's happening, but I just can't tell you what's going on precisely right now. <laughs> Unless we enter Disney and work for it. That's right, yeah. <laughs> Get hired by Disney. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome, yeah, thank try, you. Let's try to squeeze one more in from this side of the room. I just want to uh, watch the documentary. I want to thank you for sharing your roller coaster life. And I want to thank you for teaching us when you love something, it doesn't matter where you are, what you do, you, you are going to get it. And my question is, after watching a documentary, are you going to be one that is standing next to the board one day? Are we going to see the movie? You, you are actually director of that someday soon? Am I going to be the one that does director? Work? Oh, you were talking about that your dream is, was always standing next to the board and say if it's working or not in a documentary. I'm asking, is that a day going to happen sometime soon? Yeah, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm always looking to the next, the next challenge, the next job. Uh, I, I look forward to whatever happens next. I've been very lucky. I've, I, I've had a long and, and uh, fun career, and I've had a ball learning and learning from the best and I look forward to any new challenges that come my way, be it directing or writing or whatever the, the future might bring. I think what's great about this business is that you never know what's going to happen next. And 
That's what keeps it fresh and exciting for me because I don't know what's going to happen next. I feel today at age 82, I could be age 22 because I remain excited about the business, you know, as I was when I first came into it back in the 1950s. It still excites me. It still challenges me. I love it. And whatever the future might bring for me, I eagerly embrace it. So, uh, yeah, I want to do more things. I don't feel like I'm done yet. I still want to do more because as long as I'm alive, I'm going to keep doing what I do. Thank you. That's great. Well, let's give them a big round of applause. <laughs> you guys are generous. Thank you very much. So. Now go out there and do something cool. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. So, Floyd, thanks so much for coming to SIGGRAPH this Thank year. Thank you, Steve. It's been a pleasure. It's absolute yeah. pleasure. For our audience, just a, a little programming note. Um, in the studio experience, which is right outside the exhibit hall, we have a whole schedule of industry luminaries, Academy Award winners, just a wide range of folks that we're going to be interviewing. Um, so if you want to stop by, um, we'll be doing this starting tomorrow. Feel free. And uh, thank you just so much for taking the time to yeah. be here and sharing your story with us. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much.